Okay, I'd like to welcome you all here today. This is, uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to be here. This is my first uh, student event. Uh, so this is, uh, it's just, it's very, very exciting to me and it's very exciting the, the nature of the event, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more uh, about shortly. This is, today we're gonna begin the first of three panels dedicated to the first 25 years on the bench of an important member of our family, Judge Frank Easterbrook. Uh, the formal title for this is, quote, the interrogation is unceasing, a quarter century of Judge Frank Easterbrook on the Seventh Circuit. Now, informally, for the past couple of weeks, we've been calling this the Easterbrook Festival, uh, so not, not quite that other title. Uh, now, Frank Easterbrook is someone of immense importance uh, to our school. He was a member of the class of 1973, an editor of our law review, and a member of our faculty since 1979. And uh, by, you know, I have just gotten to know Frank in the past month, uh, as I have mo many members of our faculty, but talking with people about him and the little I've seen, he's described variously as a force of nature uh, in faculty roundtables and workshops, a brilliant classroom teacher, rigorous, demanding, a scholar, now this I know because I don't have to know Frank to know this, a scholar of great importance in law and economics, antitrust law, securities, as well as judicial interpretation and someone who has continued to be a scholar uh, while on the bench uh, in a tradition that our school has. Now, Frank is also known for his creative and incisive language and his opinions for elevating the level of discourse, both in his written opinions and in oral argument. And he's had a huge influence on legal education. I would imagine each one of you has read at least one Easterbrook decision. They're in case books, all sorts of case books, in law classrooms all over the country, and are prized not just for their incisive analysis of legal issues, but also by being clear and many times quite interesting. Now, I was just told some an interesting factoid about Judge Easterbrook, and that was that he has a house in Alaska that you actually go to during the winter. <laughs> of course. Now, now, to someone who has a month ago lived in Los Angeles, uh, coming to uh, coming to Chicago, I, I, I must say this is uh, uh, quite quite astounding to me. But uh, but in any event, I will not be visiting you uh, during the winter anytime soon. <laughs> Now today, pardon me? I'm not, did you say I'm not invited? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and certainly not now. Uh, the, uh, well, so today. week it's been 20 degrees colder in Chicago. Right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the, so it's because I came. The, uh, the, the moderator for today is Professor Todd Henderson, and I'm not gonna introduce the members of our faculty who you all know quite well. Todd Henderson. Uh, Omri ben Shahar is on the panel, as well as Eric Posner and uh, Randy Picker. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Todd, and we'll begin our first of the three panels of the Easterbrook Festival. Uh, okay, welcome. Thanks for coming. My role here is quite modest. I'm the timekeeper, and will enforce uh, rules and discipline in a very Easterbrookian uh, kind of a tradition. I have to say, as a a personal story to start, this is my only chance to say anything interesting, um, and it, maybe not even that interesting. Uh, I consider myself a student of Easterbrook because he wrote extensively and shaped the field that I teach and study. Uh, but I, although I was a student here, I was never a student of Easterbrook. I tried to take one of his classes, and this will tell you something about his uh, judicial personality, but I was thrown out on the first day. I don't know. If, the judge remembers this, but I was thrown out on the first day quite vigorously because I violated a rule. Uh, and that is a no-no in Judge Easterbrook's book. Uh, and I was rightfully thrown out. 
So it's important, I think, as a lesson for both uh, the judge's style and to show that you can be thrown out of classes and be a complete buffoon and still, you know, end up, I guess, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to hear today about um, the judge's work in contracts and copyright. We'll have uh, judge, uh, uh, Professor Picker and Professor Poser talking about a very similar case, the ProCD case, and Professor ben Shahar talking about pre-closing liability. We'll have about eight or ten minutes for each of them to tell us about an Easterbrook opinion, and then I would encourage you all to think of good questions because it's your opportunity to ask them about their works and the judge about his work in this area. So with that, Professor Ben Shahar. <coughs> Thank you. Can I stand there? Yeah, yeah. do whatever you want. <laughs> the, uh, my paper, my, my talk is not only about the case, it's about the problem that the case represents and that the, that, uh, pr uh, the case of Empro versus Bolko decided uh, by uh, Judge Easterbrook soon after he uh, was appointed to the bench uh, it became a very influential, resolved the problem that was then very open. So here's the problem. The problem is what to do with agreements that are reached in the course of negotiations but are not the final agreements. These are ag sometimes agreements to agree that memorialize some of the understandings that the parties reach, but specifically say that there's more room, room for more negotiations, or agreements subject to a final closing, subject to a final document to be prepared, to iron out the more, some, some more details, and to be signed at some future date. What happens if one of the parties wants to walk away after the reaching of that a, a, a preliminary agreement, but before the actual closing? Now this is a hard problem for contract law to resolve because there are very strong st uh, uh, pulls to both directions, the arguments that pull to both directions, and you don't really know what, how to, you can't ignore either. On the one hand, there is an agreement. The party said, we think we, these are the terms, they call it letter of intent. There is an intent in that letter. Uh, on the other hand, the parties say, this is not the entire agreement. We want to agree, we want to reserve the right not to be bound until to a contract until we have the full thing ironed out. So traditionally, um, historically, these things were not binding. Um, there is a trajectory, very interesting, developing trajectory uh, along different paths. I won't have time to uh, recount it here, of um, moving towards more uh, limited, limited types of liability uh, in different uh, uh, jurisdictions. The Europeans started even in the 19th century applying measures of liability to break, to, uh, to walking away from this kind of preliminary understanding. Uh, courts in the U.S. have joined in the second half of the 20th century. But the most uh, uh, kind of startling development happened a couple of years before the case that I'm talking about in the famous case in Texas, a, a, a famous case uh, of Penzo versus Texaco. Um, court uh, court have, has found, found that a very short me uh, memo documenting an agreement over several terms, a handful of terms, constituted a binding contract for the uh, takeover of Getty oil, oil, a conglomerate. A very large, sophisticated uh, uh, transaction could be reached in that, could be found to be, a, a contract could be found in that particular uh, preliminary uh, agreement. That was a kind of a shock, I think, to uh, at least I, I wasn't a legal scholar at that time. I was a teenager, or, or, or maybe, I guess by then I was uh, maybe starting my law, uh, as a law student, starting my law career. I did not follow what was happening in negotiation rooms, but the law reviews and the many law reviews that were uh, published on that particular issue suggested that this was kind of a shock to the system. People don't know what type of things are binding and what types of things are not. Uh, Empro versus Bolko, the decision by uh, Frank, um, put in a sense an end to the uncertainty. In no uncertain terms, the case says that these kind of nego unless there is a clear and strict, strictly, you know, a, a inferable indication of intent to be bound, these agreements subject to are not uh, binding. Uh, when parties write that more things need to be agreed upon or some clarifications are needed, this is a, an indication that they do not yet intend to be bound. 
the decision makes a lot of sense. I have to say that when they read it, they discuss it with students, it is a, a persuasive. In that particular case, two companies were negotiating a merger, a, a, or excuse me, a sale of a, was it, a negotiations over the sale of a company. The buyer and the seller reached an agreement, a preliminary agreement, um, but there were things to iron out, substantial things that they ended up not agreeing over. And so if you have to choose between a contract forcing the seller who no longer wants to sell to complete the, the, this transaction versus no contract, it seems that over, between these two choices, the no contract outcome makes more sense. Um, the problem why it is not satis satisfactory is because there was some kind of partial assent. Parties reached, uh, so to speak, you know, uh, some fraction of a contract, and yet they're getting the seller is getting away with zero liability. What my paper is trying to do, and I will not have time to elaborate on the details, is to suggest that when you have a partial understanding, an agreement that is halfway contract, we can have halfway liability. If we have more than halfway contract, we can have more than halfway liability. We can try to make the degree of liability correspond to the degree of assent that the parties reach. Um, this is, a, I call this an intermediate liability regime. and. I try to also, I've studied that in the past different ways in which you can get this kind of intermediate regimes and I concluded that many possible liability rules that try to split the liability in all sorts of interesting conceptual ways are impossible to implement because they require informations that courts often don't have. But the particular notion that I focus on here is, makes more sense and can be, a, perhaps can be a operational um, <clears throat> And, the, the, but, and, and so the, it, 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 briefly, this is what we try to do. The reason we want to have intermediate liability is not just aesthetic. Parties reached two-thirds of a contract. There need needs to be two-thirds liability. This is not the point. The point is that liability serves a particular functional uh, uh, purpose, and the purpose is to encourage parties to make pre-contractual investments in those negotiations. The more they invest in pre-contractual uh, reliance, the more surplus they can create and the more likely they are to enter into surplus creating uh, transactions and to walk away with, that, with those that do not create surplus. So pre-contractual investment in uh, all, uh, all sorts of things, in, in information and in actual physical investments often make a lot of sense. The problem is that if you know that you're making an investment but it can be completely lost, squandered, by virtue of the other party walking away, or the other party threatening to walk away, telling you, I'm going to walk away unless I can expropriate some of this, the value from this investment, what economists call the holdup problem, there will be too little investment, there will be too many non-serious parties entering negotiations, and too many serious parties being having their incentive to enter negotiation and to make this investment chilled. So we want to resolve that problem, and the pro resolve that problem I propose by the, using the, the following idea. The idea is to uh, uh, call it a no retraction. If you have those things on which you have agreed upon, you cannot back out of. Those are binding, but they're not binding as a contract, because there are other things in the that preliminary agreement resolves only some issues. There are issues left open. What about these other things? If this were a contract then the other things will be resolved through gap fillers. But both parties said, we don't want to be bound yet to those things. We want to be able to have veto power over the open issues. So a party, in, in, under the regime that I'm discussing, a party would have an option to enforce a contract with the, ter the terms that were agreed upon, supplemented by the terms that are most favorable to the other party within reason. Call it within reason, name, na namely in the context of the negotiations, maybe these are the demands that the other party made originally, or this is what a court would evaluate to be uh, um, the most, you know, th th uh, uh, the other party named the term that they would be willing to concede to, that it has to be within reason. A party, the option to enforce a contract like that, that includes the terms agreed upon, plus the terms most reasonable within reason to the other party, is, does not, again, doesn't mean that this is a contract. The measure of liability is if the other party doesn't want, the seller in emperor doesn't want these terms, can walk away. Doesn't want the terms that he agreed upon and the terms that are most favorable to him, 
I mean, I'm not sure what reasonable grounds does the party have to walk away from that. I argue they don't have any reasonable grounds. But if they want to walk away from that, fine, but not for free. The other party incurred some costs. Reliance investment incurred after the agreement, those should be borne by the party who is refusing to enter a contract based on everything that was agreed upon and everything that is favorable to him or her. So uh, this I, I, sh I don't in the paper only loosely. In the, some other st uh, research I did in the past, I show that this would lead to optimal pre-contractual reliance. So I think in terms of at least the economic framework, it makes a lot of sense. There, of course, are issues whether of implementations. Can court do that or not? I, I have a, a view, and, and I try to, to suggest that it can be done. I, in the, the, this particular, I mean, with this, I will zero. Minus, negative two. Uh, um, in this particular paper, I, the way to show that this can be done was by going back to the case file of the district court that heard Emperor versus Bolko, reading the negotiation, what happened, the, what were the negotiations with the parties, why did the negotiations fail after the agreement, and showing that they failed for a, because of the seller insisting on reopening something that was already in the, agreed upon in the agreement. So the seller was being opportunistic. It's not that the, seller, the parties reached a stalemate due to being unable to resolve the uh, remaining issues. The remaining issues were minimal. Were, were, you know, should we use this prime rate publication or that? Should we have a no compete or not? And in fact, the buyer was willing to concede whatever, everything in this. And that, uh, everything was in the papers, the negotiation, the letters between the parties. But the seller wanted to reopen a major issue had to do with security interest. The buyer said, no, that we can't, we won't let you. The seller walked away. I would have said in this particular case, you violated the no retraction norm. And, you've, and in, because of that violation, you want to uh, you have to incur at least reliance liability. No stop here. Thank you, Omri. And now another uh, uh, Easterbrook contract case uh, from Professor Posner. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm going to talk about ProCD versus uh, Zeidenberg, uh, which is a case I've taught many times. So if you're in my contracts class, you, you can leave. Oh. Um, unless you're, you were in my contracts class last year or the year before, because I made a number of mistakes, I realized, <laughs> in the course of writing this paper. So the reason why I wanted to write about ProCD versus Eisenberg is that um, it's probably the single most criticized opinion in contract law written over the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, the, the, it's hard to exaggerate the, um, the hostility of the reception with a professor saying things like, if this were an exam, I'd give it an F. <laughs> now, when there's, a, when there's such a typhoon of negative... Uh, overwhelming uh, negative, uh, sorry, when there's such a typhoon of negative academic uh, reaction to an opinion, that's usually a good sign that the opinion is actually pretty good. And, um, and in fact, that's my conclusion. I actually think that this opinion is a kind of a masterpiece. I, I call it a masterpiece of realist uh, uh, jurisprudence. I'm not sure whether Frank would actually consider that a compliment, but uh, it's meant as one. So let me explain why, why I think that. Uh, very quickly, uh, a guy named Zeidenberg goes into the store. He buys um, uh, a box, and in the box is basically a database with telephone numbers in it. And uh, there are two versions of this product. There's a consumer version, and there's a business version. And the consumer version is cheap, and the business version is expensive. <coughs> Zeidenberg buys the consumer version, takes it home, puts it up on the internet, and, tr and, sells, and sells access to these telephone numbers. Uh, ProCD brings a lawsuit seeking an injunction. They say, hey, you know, he bought the cheap uh, uh, non-commercial version. He shouldn't be doing this. The district court says, sorry, uh, Zeidenberg wins. Um, and then the Seventh Circuit, in an opinion written by Judge Easterbrook, reverses. Now, uh, first let me just say something about why this opinion is important. Well, it's important for a lot of reasons. But from an academic perspective, what makes it particularly interesting is it addresses a very difficult problem that's actually been around long before the existence of the internet and databases and so forth, or computer databases. It's the problem of um, conveying a great deal of information very quickly to a consumer. The seller knows a lot about the product. The consumer knows very little. Um, in the modern world, products are very complicated. It's very hard for the consumer to figure out what, how this product's going to work. 
And on top of that, um, there are features of the product which are actually just legal features, you might say. There's a difference between a database that can be used only for consumer purposes and a database that can be used for business purposes. This is stipulated by the contract. And these sorts of terms have to be conveyed, or one might think, ought to be conveyed to the consumer so he knows what he's, he's getting. In a, in a related case, Hill versus Gateway, which uh, Frank also wrote, a person buys a computer over the phone. The computer arrives, and then later the, the person has a problem with it, and he discovers that part of the con in the contract an, an arbitration clause exists. And it may very well be in the interest of everybody for arbitration to determine the outcome of cases like this. But it's hard for the, uh, for the uh, uh, seller to convey this information to the consumer. You're, you're talking to an operator on the phone. Do you actually want the operator to uh, tell you the terms of the contract? As, uh, as Frank says in his opinion, uh, such information is more likely to anesthetize you than to enlighten you, which is very clever. Uh, you'll have to read it to get the full force of the humor, I, I suppose. <laughs> now, how do you solve this problem? Um, how do you, and, and the, so the district court sol, sol, you know, sort of purports to solve it in the following way. Um, well, in order for a contract to be enforceable, both sides have to consent to it. Zeidenberg didn't know that um, there was this uh, license restriction that uh, limits his use to, uh, to, to uh, non-commercial purposes. Now, there was on the outside of the box a term which said, by the way, there are other terms inside the box Okay. Now you can you can take it home and it, you can take it home and learn what those uh, terms are. But basically, um, we're giving you warning that there are additional terms, but we're not saying we're not telling you what 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 those are. And it turns out that inside the box there's this license. Now Zeidenberg could have returned the uh, the the product once he read the license, but he didn't. The judge says, look, the contract was formed at the time that Zeidenberg, the district judge says, the, the contract was formed at the time that Zeidenberg bought the product at the store. He didn't know about this non-commercial use clause, so he can't be bound by it. Now, in a broader perspective, what's troubling about this, of course, this sounds very intuitive. You shouldn't be bound to obligations that you don't know about. But the bro broader problem is it's impossible for sellers to convey this type of information to buyers. Buyers don't have the time to listen to them, don't want to listen to them. So if this were really the world in which we lived with, it would look very different. Um, it would be much harder to uh, transact if we took this uh, court's uh, approach. Now, there's an opposite approach, which I think uh, which is interesting, that, that Frank could have taken, and he, at, part, at, at points in the opinion, it sounded like he was going to take them, but then he pulls back. So here's the opposite approach. Yes, it's true that uh, consent is the basis of contract, and, uh, and you can only consent to what you know. But Zeidenberg knew that there were hidden terms in this contract, and he consented to take the risk that those terms were terms that he wouldn't like. Now, Frank could have stopped there, and that could have been the end of the opinion, right? So he, he takes the box home, and no matter what it says inside the box, he's bound to them. He doesn't have to buy it if he doesn't want to. And you might have thought that that would have been the outcome of the opinion. But uncharacteristically, uh, Frank uh, hedges, uh, because after all, what if the inside the box the, uh, the terms were, well, you have to hand over your firstborn child to ProCD, or <coughs> surprise, you have to pay us $10,000. Are we really going to say that Zeidenberg is bound to that uh, term. Frank doesn't say no, but he doesn't say yes either. Um, uh, and one, one gets the sense, in Hill versus Gateway, one gets the sense that, in fact, the answer is no. Because in that case, he asks, he, he, he notes that the Hills could have returned the computer if they, if they didn't like the arbitration clause, right? They could have read the contract. Of course, they didn't, but they could have. And they had 30 days to return the computer. If you don't like the arbitration clause, uh, you can return it. He, he asked, well, what if it would have been expensive for them to return the computer, to ship it back? And then he says, well, maybe in that case uh, they could get a remedy for shipping fees, which suggests that they're not really going to be required to take the risk, that uh, the full risk, that um, there may be a term in this box that they don't like. But the point is, is that uh, Frank avoids these two extremes. The one extreme is enforce anything that's in there, no matter what which could end up tripping up uh, unwary consumers. The other extreme is enforce only the terms that, the, that were actually in the brain of the consumer at the time that he buys uh, the good, which would interfere with all kinds of uh, desirable contracting. 
And his uh, solution, I think, is very clever. The sol- but also, you know, interest, you know, troublesome in some ways. The solution is, let's interpret the offer from ProCD in the following way. Offer, the offer and acceptance do not take place at the store, which is what the, uh, the district court assumed. Relying on precedence, the district court says, well, you know, at, the way this works is uh, ProCD makes the offer. Here's our product for a certain amount of money. Zeidenberg accepts the offer by paying. That's the contract. And what Frank says instead is, no, the contract isn't accepted until Zeidenberg actually uses the product. And the real offer is, you can uh, have this product if you pay money and you use it. Right? That's our, that's our offer. And Zeidenberg accepts not only by paying, but also subsequently by using it. Now, this is clever in a very straightforward way, but, but in a way that I think missed the commentators and, and the other judges. Zeidenberg is in this way given much more time to learn what the terms of the contract are. It's very hard to learn the terms of the contract at the store, you know, d- discussing it with a salesperson or reading a, a long document. And as he notes in Hills versus Gateway, you, you're not going to want to talk to the operator on the telephone about what the terms of the contract are. But if you're given this 30-day opportunity, let's say, you can, in the, in the privacy of your home, without the pressure of, of salespeople, read the uh, license or the contract and decide whether you like the product or not, or whether you're happy with the terms, and, and return it. It seems like a very reasonable compromise that takes into account both that there's not enough time to convey information at the store at the point of sale, but that people are not really able to take these sorts of gambles. Uh, you know, you, you, you're stuck with whatever's, whatever's um, inside the box. Now. This is not a perfect solution, not that there is a perfect solution. There are problems with the solution. One is, of course, there is no precedent for this. Frank just made it up, which I think is uh, admirable. Um, <laughs> this is, and this is why I think of this as, as classic realist judging. The, the existing doctrine, if you, if you applied it in a kind of literal or mechanical way, led to these two extreme outcomes that were just silly. Um, but there are some vulnerabilities in his approach. One is, is that he ultimately bases this approach on the, on the chestnut, the offer is master of the offer. The offeror is master of the offer. Well, that means that any offeror can just change the terms and say, well, in fact, the, my offer is um, you get this product and you're stuck with it. You can't return it, right? And in, in which case, we're back to the problem that we started with. Now, interestingly, I don't think that happens very much. You, you, you could imagine it happening, especially in the shrink wrap case. But offer, people seem to actually want to give uh, the buyers an opportunity to find out uh, what, what, the ter- what the terms are. And so it may well be that what Frank did here is he just identified what was sort of the implicit business norm, a norm that made sense for both sides of the transaction. It had never been explicitly articulated by parties, but it turned out that they were happy with it. And uh, other courts uh, followed uh, uh, Frank's lead. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to Randy. OK. And finally, Professor Picker, about obviously the, there's a copyright component of a database of numbers. We'll hear about that and other copyright gems from Judge Easterbrook. Thanks. So um, well, I, as I told someone, my favorite German word is Festschrift. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you should have favorite German words, but I do. Um, and uh, uh, the Festschrift is the idea of holding an academic celebration in writing to celebrate someone's work. Um, and we're lucky to have on our faculty three judges who um, have been full-time faculty members here, spent a lot of time here, have gone on to do other things, and have created a body of work that, that we as academics should wrestle with. So. Uh, this kind of celebration is, is you know, exactly what we ought to be doing. It's a fest shift, and I'm, I, I'm happy to have the chance to participate in it and look forward to doing so 25 years from now in the next one. Um, so um, I uh, you know, also just use this, I confess, as an excuse to read Frank's copyright opinion. So that was the animating principle behind my paper. I knew I was going to be teaching copyright, and I figured I'd learn something reading Frank's work. And then the question is, how do you... How do you package that some way? And so here's, here's what I did. Um, it turns out that even though Frank has written maybe uh, a dozen or so copyright opinions, if you actually survey copyright case books, they show up in shocking numbers. Um, it's, it's really quite astonishing the level of, of influence that a, that a judge can have through the well-turned phrase uh, and an eye for good problems. So, 
um, Bill Ford, who was a Bigelow fellow here a number of years ago, sort of did a study of, of you know, where copyright cases come from and what do you see in, in, in case books. And your immediate notion is, well, you'll see a lot of Supreme Court opinions. You see that in field after field. And that's obviously true in copyright as well. And then you say, well, you'll see things where copyright shows up. Um, and that means maybe publishing in New York and, and, and movies in Los Angeles. So you see a disproportionate number of opinions in case books from the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit. So, so some guy sitting in Chicago should not be doing very well. And yet it turns out that, that three and occasionally four of Frank's opinions, and again, there's only a dozen of them roughly, show up routinely in copyright case books. So it's a level of um, market dominance that should make the antitrust Judge Easterbrook a little nervous, I think. Um, and maybe you're just competing on quality, right? OK. Only if I were charging a monopoly price. Fair enough. OK. So I, took, I talk about those three opinions uh, in, 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 in the paper. So um, I focus on uh, the Nash case, which is a fun case. I just taught it in the copyright case class today. Uh, the Lee case, and then I circle back to ProCD, so let me do those quickly. So uh, Nash um, uh, uh, is a fun opinion. Uh, Nash uh, writes books in which he says uh, the John Dillinger didn't die outside the Biograph Theater. Uh, so if you think that's what's happened, that's not what happened. He digs around. Dillinger's led this. He survived. Dillinger got wind of what the FBI was doing. Um, and uh, uh, knew and knew what the lady has read was going to do, the treachery that was going to result. He avoided the whole thing and went off to live in Arizona. Um, fact. That's what Nash thinks happened. This is, this is not the counterfactual history, you know, the joke I told in copyright. If Napoleon had had a B-52 at the Battle of Waterloo, what would have happened? Right? Historians write those kind of books these days and get tenure. That's what's really amazing. Um, the counterfactual history acknowledged not to be true. For Nash, his description of what happened outside the biograph or didn't happen is fact in his mind. So Frank talks that through. As Eric noted, one of the things that's characteristic of an Easterbrook opinion is the well-turned phrase. I, I try to do those myself, so I very much admire that. So Frank talks about the state of air conditioning in the Biograph Theater uh, today. Uh, in a footnote, talks about whether Nash is the life of the party wherever he goes. Um, it's, it's sort of a fun fact setting and a, and a fun opinion to read and, and, and well-turned phrases. And the interesting issue in the case, I think, is sort of a nice fundamental one for copyright, which is what is a fact? Uh, Feist, the leading Supreme Court opinion on copyright facts, tells us that facts go into the public domain. Um, but uh, what I think of as, as, as Nash doing is, is it raises the question of how do we deal with the idiosyncratic fact, something which is a fact to only one person and is a fact to no one else. Uh, how do we do that? Of course, the copyright issue that arises, I haven't told you that, um, is um, the CBS show Simon and Simon, which you can go watch on Hulu if you want, um, basically writes an episode in which they do exactly what Nash says a bio biograph theater, or Dillinger doesn't die, and the question is, is it copyright infringement as Nash contends? Frank says, no, Nash. He told us it was a fact. Facts aren't copyrightable. Public domain, you lose. Fact only to you? Tough, right? Um, you know, had it been fictional, the analysis would have been much more complex, right? There's this question of idea abstraction. Frank says, thank God I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> Nash said it was a fact. We're going to hold him to that. So. There are a number of these interesting what's a fact question, the Seinfeld aptitude test case is an, another interesting one, but Frank sort of, I think, gets to claim one very interesting one. It shows up in the case book, idiosyncratic fact. Okay, that's case number one. Case number two is the Lee case, um, and Lee um, deals with an important question that most of us has been wrestling with since childhood, which is what is it that glue actually accomplishes? So. The situation in the Lee case, if you don't know Lee, it's a very short opinion, a terrific opinion, another lively opinion. Uh, Annie Lee you know, does these you know, art doodads um, and publishes them on note cards. Uh, you can buy those note cards. You can send them to the world. Um, the ART company realizes there's another market she could be in, and that's the note card on a tile market. So they buy note cards, they glue them to the tiles, they jack up the prices, and they sell them. 
the question is, where does that put us? Um, where Annie Lee says, oh, the copyright statute gives me uh, sole control over derivative works. That's 106.2. Uh, this is a derivative work. You've taken my work and made another work with it. Um, you can't do it. Write me a check. What does glue do? Um, so it's a really interesting situation involving price discrimination in two markets. You know, if I were to be critical of Judge Easterbrook, I say, talk more about the price discrimination issues. He does that some other places, but not so much in this opinion, right? I think there's a tricky question of market entry. So if, if, if art recognized that the note card on the tile market was an important market, how would they negotiate? It's sort of really Omri's question in some sense, right? How do you, how do you negotiate with someone and not lose the deal? And, and can you induce their a right pre-contractual reliance? Uh, the opinion doesn't do any of that, right? What I think you see in all three of these opinions is a wrestling with copyright text. I think Frank recognizes that's his job as judge. My job as an academic is to do something else, so he doesn't do that. Wrestles with the text. The derivative works definition is really ultimately quite narrow. It focuses on recasting of the work. He says the gluing of it is not a recasting. If you frame the work, that's not a recasting. There's no change to the underlying work. Um, and therefore, no derivative work is created. That's case two. Case three is ProCD. Um, uh, Zeidenberg, you know, when I come up with my list of public enemies, Zeidenberg's high on my list. Um, because what I see in that case is a, uh, someone trying to deal with the fact that facts are not copyrightable, the great advantage of price discrimination in separating two markets, which is what I see ProCD doing. Frank talks about that in the opinion. Frank talks about that in maybe his only academic article on copyright. So he has an article on that in which he talks that through. Um, so I see ProCD as, as this wonderful entity and Mark Zeidenberg as evil incarnate. Um, um, so I'm with Eric and saying, thank God Frank came up with a fix. But the important point to note is, is that it wasn't just a fix to contract because there's a second issue. Um, and the second issue has to do with wh the, whether or not Section 301 of the Copyright Statute preempts the underlying contract. That's actually an incredibly important uh, issue about the relationship between contract and copyright. Um, and Frank undoubtedly knows that he has fared just as poorly with copyright scholars as he has with contract scholars. So Frank's resolution of this, which is to say that uh, copyright effectively deals with relationships good against the world, while contract deals with relationships good as between the parties that distinguishes copyright and contract and means that contract remedies and contracts are not preempted by 301, means the contract is valid in this situation, notwithstanding copyright. That is, as I say, um, uh, the copyright world likes the result in Nash, likes the result in Lee, and they really hate ProCD. Um, and so, um, uh, for many of the same reasons Eric Dud said, I, I'm a big fan of ProCD and happy with the analysis. I think the contract and copyright interaction there is an incredibly important issue because with a world of micro-consent online, the possibility for a robust contractual regime in dealing with copyright-like objects is a meaningful one. And therefore, understanding the interaction between copyright and contract is very important. Uh, and ProCD provides a sort of nice baseline for that. I'll stop there. Perfect. OK, that, that was great. So we want to give uh, the judge here a chance to comment, if he wants, on these. And then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Judge? I have a, a few comments, although they're, they're more on the subject matter as opposed to the papers. I want to say I'm, I'm very happy to see that a 21-year-old opinion like Impro is still alive. Justice Holmes said that the entirety of the common law is recapitulated in judicial decisions at least once every generation, implying that decisions more than 20 years old are just dead and gone. So I'm, I'm happy to see that there is one, although it must be on life support at 21 years old. Uh, the other reason I'm happy to see that uh, any attention is paid to a case like Empro is that I know absolutely nothing about contract law. Right? It's, as has been emphasized, it's not one of my fields of academic expertise. And what's, what's even worse than my not knowing anything particular about contract law my, my contracts teacher, by the way, was Grant Gilmore, and he said he didn't much like contract law either, <laughs> although he wrote about it incessantly. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that contracts are not something over which federal courts have any authority. 
right? MPRO construes or purports to construe or makes a stab at construing the contract law of the state of Wisconsin. It turns out that Pro CD is also a Wisconsin case, and part of it is a stab at construing the law of sales in the state of Wisconsin. That means that if the federal court commits, it, first it's kind of puzzling why case books would have federal opinions on contract law when it's, it's not authoritative in any way. But it also means that if the federal judges get it wrong, uh, the state judiciary can say so. The one thing that I found interesting about Pro CD in particular is that the large degree of academic outrage all of which in Pro CD seems to be, this opinion differs from what I think of as the optimal outcome in the world and therefore it's wrong. <laughs> uh, if the academic outrage actually strikes a chord with state legislators or state judges or anything like that, a case like Pro CD would sink without a trace. Uh, and so far as I know, it hasn't sunk uh, without a trace, or at least people are screaming after it in the streets still. So there, there must be some uh, virtue to it. So having, having said that as an apology, I think I ought to say a few words about what informs uh, my contract jurisprudence in particular. There, there are things that paper givers didn't mention, uh, but which are, I think, very much associated with this law school. Certainly should be. One, which really is driving cases like uh, MPRO, the, the partial agreement problem, is the contract is objective. Lawyer after lawyer comes to court and says, my client assumed or believed or intended such and such a thing uh, with what I did. And therefore, I'm entitled to go to a jury who will say that such and such a thing must be my client's actual entitlement. And my understanding, this was something that even Grant Gilmore agreed with, is that all of, all of our states have an objective theory of contract. So that whenever you see the word intent or meeting of the minds or anything like that, the part they're not actually talking about intent or meeting of the minds. Again, they're, they're talking Oliver Wendell Holmes' line. That when, when a judge uses the word intent, he's really referring to the reasonable person an objective version of intent. So in contract law, uh, the intent of the parties and the meeting of the minds and so on is not something that happens inside your skull, but what happens outside. It has to do with the words or symbols or signs that are exchanged with other people. That, after all, is, is not only the only thing uh, judges can get their, their hands on, uh, but it's absolutely fundamental to a system of exchange. So that when somebody comes to court, as one of the parties did in MPRO, and says, well, it's true if you actually look at the symbols we exchanged, all the drafts we exchanged, all the other stuff we sent back and forth, none of us ever committed to a contract. We had in, the, in these arrangements the thing, this is subject to approval by the board, and so on. Now, you should just ignore all of that, because actually, despite what symbols we used, we actually intended to be bad. So we want you to, to look inside our head. It seems to me very important uh, in order to promote commerce not to try to look inside people's heads because not only will you not be able to, but if you could actually look <coughs> inside the heads of the contracting parties, you'd find some bizarre combination of money-raising schemes and sexual fantasies. <laughs> Goodness only knows what, what all, but it wouldn't be something you could deal with through the means of, of litigation. The, the second and related is that even among the world of exchange signs, you very much want to prefer the written signs to the oral signs. Outside the domain of the statute of frauds, it's possible to form a contract by an entirely verbal exchange. But most people set up their dealings so that the verbal exchanges don't count. If you actually look at normal commercial contracts that are drafted by lawyers, they'll have clauses in them saying that the verbal exchanges don't count. There are clauses that try to reinforce the parole evidence rule. There are clauses that these days they're often called big boy clauses. 
There are clauses that say the only things we've relied on in this transaction are the things we have written down and signed. They're called big boy clauses in the sense of we're big boys and we can look after ourselves. Right? We don't want judges trying to figure out what people said to one another and using that as the basis for a binding contract. Uh, not, not only because some people behave strategically, they'll report things that weren't said as having been said, but also because lawyers know, certainly sophisticated commercial lawyers know, uh, that if you go through a, a contractual negotiation and then talk to your client afterward about what was said, what they remember having been said won't tally completely with what you remember having been said. That's just the way human memory works. It's extremely difficult. People pick up on certain things as being salient and others as not. So that the reported, the report of what is being said won't be congruent, even when everybody's trying to remember uh, the truth. Uh, and that means uh, that to the extent you can make contract more objective, you're, again, helping to promote trade. And finally, particularly important for this school, I should think, clarity sets up bargaining. Clarity in judicial rules sets up bargaining. This is, of course, the key insight of the Coase theorem that in a world of zero transactions costs, people will negotiate, move to the, the optimal outcome. We, we live in a world of positive transactions costs, but judges shouldn't do anything to increase transactions costs. They should do what they can to hold them down because then you'll get simple bargaining. Now think about the problem of, of MPRO and the, the suggestion that people can reach contracts in stages. So if they've agreed on the, the security for the deal, uh, that's, that's just agreed and that will be enforced judicially and the unagreed issues are, are left to be agreed in the future. Is that a clear rule? You get, you're going to get all sorts of problems back in my first two points about oral statements, about reliance on intent, uh, you're going to get grave difficulties in figuring out what is actually open and what is closed. Imagine the rule, if you've agreed on security, on you know, what the terms of the security agreement will be, that's fixed. But of course you can still negotiate about the rate of interest because you haven't finally agreed on the rate of interest. And one party says to the other, you know, looking back at this, I think our security terms are bad. We can keep the current security terms, uh, and then I'm going to want to charge 50% a year interest. Or we can change the security terms, and I'll charge you 5% a year interest. Uh, is that permissible? Not permissible on the ground that even though they haven't agreed on the rate of interest yet, <coughs> trying to collect a rate of interest that would undermine the already agreed on terms. Right, you, you can see the problem. It greatly increases the cost of transacting. And one thing that happens when you increase the cost of transacting, not only do you lose the, some of the consumer surplus from the deal, but the amount of the consumer surplus can easily be transmit, transmuted into rents or into transactions costs. And who gets the transactions costs? Well, of course, lawyers get the transactions costs. So in the end, lawyers will, clients will pay their lawyers up to the amount they can save from the litigation. But you don't want a rule that allows the benefits of transacting to be consumed by the legal costs. What you want, I think, is a rule that is as simple-minded as possible, even if it takes some subtlety to come up with the rule. You want a rule that's perfectly straightforward and understandable, sets up property rights against which people can negotiate and uh, hold down on legal fees. And I don't feel any I don't feel guilty uh, about trying to achieve that in common law cases because if I've said, you know, if I've, as I said earlier, if it's yeah, a mistake, there are two ways out. First, the state supreme courts can tell me where to go with my decision. Uh, and the other thing people can do is they can take their right to bargain and adopt a better rule. <coughs> Again, think about the proposed rule that, of incremental negotiation. Once you've agreed on the security, that's agreed. Uh, and we now move on to other things. It would be very easy to set up 
something like the American Contract Bargaining Association. Just there are such associations set up. Think about the American Arbitration Association. They sell decisional services, and they sell it under a set of rules. You go if you sign up to have your dispute resolved by the American Arbitration Association. There's a sheaf of rules that they will give you and say, "This is how we resolve your dispute." If you don't like these rules, either go to court and get the rules of civil procedure or go to a different arbitrator. You can easily imagine that being done in, in contracts. The American, you know, the American Partial Contract Bargaining Association uh, could be formed, and two businesses, when they start negotiating, could say, we're going to negotiate under the American Partial Contract Bargaining Association rules. So that if we reach agreement on any one issue, that's going to stick, and we will slowly whittle down the rest of the issues. If there is a benefit to be had, I would expect somebody to go into business, offer that set of rules, attract business, uh, and see if they can get it. The fact that we haven't seen that is, to my mind, informative, but also suggests a good business opportunity for people to go and see if they can do that in the future. And by the way, the, the rules for the American contract, the American Partial Contract Bargaining Association would, I am sure, be copyrightable. <laughs> right? So you, nobody else could just copy the rules and go into business themselves. But we've seen, by the way, state and local governments have tried to copyright their statutes. Uh, we've had some local governments try to copyright their zoning codes. I, I find that hilarious. Uh, let me, let me, I'm not going to say anything separate about uh, the, the other issues. But I do want to talk about what usefully can be done uh, by scholars in analyzing judicial opinions like Pro-CD. The, the many academic complaints about Pro-CD are in one way or another of the form a terms later approach enables sellers to bamboozle consumers by hiding the terms and then of course they they get bushwhacked later by terms they never would have agreed to had there been an opportunity to agree to these terms ex ante. It put to one side the questions about can you send the box back and who pays for the postage and so on. This is an empirical prediction and I would think that it would be possible to test this prediction. There, there'd be two basic ways of testing the prediction. One of them was tested, by the way, in the most recent issue of the Journal of Legal Studies. Uh, they, this way of testing it says, OK, let's go and get a, a large selection of the terms that come in inside the box, where you see the terms only after you've bought the box. <coughs> and these may be terms. You know, they may be terms for whether you can use the software in a particular way. They may be warranty clauses. You may open the box and find that it has only a limited 90-day warranty rather than a full warranty. It's that Magnuson Moss Act would use that term. All right, so go out, gather up a large selection of terms inside the box, and then compare them with the terms that sellers offer where the terms are on the outside of the box, where it says on the outside of the box, limited warranty or full warranty or you can use this software program any way you want or, or think about another question for software. Uh, on how many computers can you install this piece of software? Just one? Two computers? You know, another term says you can install this software on all the computers you own provided that only one of them is being used at a time. Right? These, these are all terms. So gather up whether the terms inside the box, the terms outside the box, and see if they're different. The people who complained about ProCD would predict that they're different. My prediction, for what it's worth, is that they would not be different. And in the ProCD case, I relied on some work uh, to that effect by George Priest, one of my classmates in the class of 73, who had done that study for warranty terms and found they weren't different. Well, that's now been done for licensing, software licensing terms uh, in the most recent issue of the Journal of Legal Studies, and it found, as I had expected, that there's no difference. Uh, so that suggests that you know, if there's no difference in the terms, you always want to reduce transaction costs, and ProCD uh, does that. The other way of doing this study is to ask whether businesses eat their own dog food. That is, if you take 
Pro CD against Zeidenberg, which had these terms inside the box. You can't make software without licensing other people's software. Is Pro CD offering its consumers worse terms than the terms for which it negotiated with its own software vendors? All right, so you could ask, you know, look at the terms that Microsoft negotiates. Well, negotiates. You get a box of Microsoft Office software, it's got terms in it. Microsoft is also a big buyer of software from other people. Are the terms that Microsoft offers you as a customer of its software different from the terms on which Microsoft insists when it is the licensee of other people's software? And you would think Microsoft would probably uh, represent itself pretty well in those negotiations. My understanding is that that kind of study has also been done uh, and found that the terms are pretty much similar. There, there are some I've seen one study that said there were small differences in the terms, but nothing that sounded very serious. And this is the kind of thing that I, you know, I think people ought to be doing those studies, because if you do those studies and you find bad consequences, if you find, for example, that terms inside the box are materially worse than terms outside the box, at least I, and I think a lot of my colleagues, are willing then to think again about the right outcome in these cases. But if you think the terms turn out to be the same, uh, then you don't really want to think that again. And that the model of the plaintiff, uh, sorry, the, the model of the Zeidenberg had in mind, the model that the, the district court had in mind in Pro CD against Zeidenberg, was one in that you have now all run into, I assume, in click wrap licenses where you go to some website and the website says, before you can agree to this website, you have to, before you can use this website, you have to agree to our privacy policy. And they then put up their privacy policy. The privacy policy appears in a little box on your screen. It's a very little box. In order to see, in order to read the privacy policy, you have to scroll down how many pages in the box. The lawyers will have told them that in order for this to be legally effective, you have to make the terms conspicuous. The only way a lawyer knows how to make terms conspicuous is to put it in all capital text. <laughs> so what you get in this tiny box on your screen is 6,000 words in all capital text, which no human being can read. Right? There is, by the way, typographers think that you would never put anything in all capital text. The problem with capital text is that all the letters look the same. That when you actually read real, real writing, you judge letters by their shape. And in all capital text, every letter has the same shape. It's the same height. It's the same width. So if you wanted to make things extremely hard to read and understand, you'd put it in all capital text. And so that's what lawyers do. How many of you have ever read one of those things, right? You click, you just click, I approve, because you're relying on some shoppers, maybe, to examine them, or you're relying on the reputation of the seller. Uh, you're hoping they're not going to, that there's not something buried in that that says, and oh, by the way, uh, after you've used this website for 100 days, you owe us an extra $10,000. Right? You're confident somebody would have seen that if it were there. And so you don't read it yourself. You use this as an information conservation device. Uh, that, that's the idea behind uh, decisions like ProCD. Uh, but I, I think I've told you pretty much what, how I approach uh, cases like this uh, and why in, in common law areas like this, I feel perfectly comfortable in uh, making things up, provided you don't make up too much at one time. Uh, I, I do feel differently about statutes. Some of the papers in here, uh, some of the other papers, maybe papers for the workshop uh, on Wednesday, accuse me of making things up in statutes. I may take more, more uh, <coughs> umbrage of that, but we'll come to that on Wednesday. Okay, that was enlightening. Uh, now's the opportunity for the next about 20 or so minutes to hear from people in the audience who are confident in the opt-out of the Ben-Jahar rule. Why can't we opt in? And this is something along the lines that Judge Easterbrook suggested. I mean, you could have this fantasy uh, association he mentioned, but you could also just, as the parties, you could have them agree that they will be bound by a certain amount of damages in the event of a certain uh, walkaway. So we have a letter of intent with a $10,000 kicker. Um, 
And certainly you see in the context, and, and I know this case arose in a, in a corporate negotiation, you know, there's, there's an asymmetry in the fiduciary duties that are owed. The buyer always can walk away. I'm sorry, the seller can always walk away because the seller's board has to have fiduciary duties to the, to the shareholders. And so you can imagine there's going to be heterogeneity around the types of bargains. So for some, in some cases, breakup fees or reverse breakup fees or negotiated damages might make sense, in other cases not. Why isn't an opt-in better than an opt-out? <clears throat> um, it's a good question, and I think that uh, it's probably a question you can ask on any, in the study of any contract law rule. Contract law is a field that has very few mandatory rules that forbid parties to opt out. Most of the con contract law rules are default rules that parties can vary by agreement. So in some sense, the stake at get of that is involved in getting the rule right is mitigated by the fact that parties, if the rule is terrible, parties can uh, in sometimes in a very quick and easy and cheap way write a different rule. Um, the idea of selecting the right default rule is to, is again, a kind of a cozy and basic cozy and, uh, idea of saving the parties the cost to opt out uh, saving the majority of the parties the cost to opt out. We want to find the rule that most parties will want most of the time. And now, there are, how do you know that? And it, of course, it's very hard to know, in a, a in a, especially doing a theoretical, no, not serving all the parties. Uh, um, the methodologies that, that I invoked in the paper is asking what kind of rule would increase the surplus in a particular way. Um, I isolated one variable, and the variable is the incentive to make reliance expenditures, pre-contractual reliance expenditures. Now, I completely take uh, a, you know, my, uh, Frank's critique and says there is something else that might trump that. It is more important for parties to get to know, to, to have a level of clarity. It might be more important for parties to know and to be able to predict what courts will do. And a rule that says, unless you reached closing, there is no contract, is very easy to predict. It might dampen and reduce the incentives to, uh, to rely, but, uh, to the, but it, that, that is no big deal because in the parties can sometimes, when the incentives to make reliance expenditures are particularly important, can opt in, as they do in the con a corporate merger uh, scenario, and uh, clearly state uh, the uh, the regime that is that they want to be in. So to the extent that parties think that they live in their no liability regime, uh, they do opt in, and and these are uh, and these are uh, these are the outcomes. I have a question. If I were asking, yeah, please. So, do you, when you write, I mean, obviously you're going to do this all week. So the question is, is when you write a particular opinion, do you have a sense of? the likely academic reaction which is going to ensue. So this one's going to generate 25 articles, this one two, this one, well, n run the number of sites on ProCD. It's really quite extraordinary. No, I, I rarely have any sense uh, of that question. I, I thought there would be a reaction to ProCD because shrink wrap and click wrap and other similar licenses were becoming much more common. Uh, and. Of course, this was an e software was an increasingly important business, and I knew there were no cases out there. So I thought that might get a, a reaction, uh, but how big a reaction or what reaction? You know, I thought there was a significant chance that within a year the Supreme Court of Wisconsin would question uh, which kind of mushrooms the judges of the Seventh Circuit had been eating, uh, and and go off in a different direction. What I, I certainly had no anticipation that ProCD would prove to be very persuasive with judges and anathema to a whole bunch of legal scholars. That's a very odd outcome. Yeah. When you were, the, the point that Eric was making about, uh, you <laughs> kind of went halfway, so you didn't say that you know, the $10,000 or, you know, we're going to eat your child uh, would be okay. Were you... Were How about you, a pound of flesh? That well, is whatever. A, okay. The, the, that has a historical pedigree. Okay. The, were you conscious that you were stepping back from the precipice? Was it necessary to get a second vote on the case? Oh, no. It, it, wasn't, you, it, wasn't, was the, it wasn't remotely necessary. What, what ProCD was arguing, in fact, what uh, Gateway 2000 argued in, in the later Hill case. Uh, and in every similar case of this sort that I've seen, 
it was the seller who came forward and said a variation of that. He said, look, you know, you could imagine some kind of loony corporation putting weird terms in the box about extra prices due later. Uh, and if we actually did that, word would get around, we wouldn't sell any products. That would be really stupid. Uh, we actually put on our box, if you don't like these terms, or put on our license where you tear it open or click on it or something like that. If you don't want it, return it for a full refund. Exactly so that we don't get an adverse inference drawn. I mean, they, don't, they didn't use the academic terms, but the lawyers are saying, we did this for business purposes. We can't believe anybody would not do something similar. And I thought it appropriate to make that observation in the opinion that the, the people who are designing these systems of licensing terms are doing so in order to maximize their revenue, not in order to cause consumers the screaming EBGs, which will cause them not to sell their product. I mean, it, it would be very interesting if, if anybody could come up with an example of the adverse terms that are in the box that are not, not within the scope of normal expectation. I do think they're adverse. Well, the gateway. Pardon? The gateway case was, was exactly such a case. In, in the gateway case, the arbitration clause provided that, I don't remember the exact figures, but if your computer, it's a regular, you know, desktop computer, if your computer, if you have a problem, you go to arbitration. The problem was that the arbitration fee was $4,000. So uh, you're not going to use it, right? Um, so, so there was a later unconscionability case where that clause was struck down. I, I, this, the, this did not, for whatever reason, it didn't arise in uh, well, Frank's it, case. Yeah, but, but that is, a, that is a, you know, a surprise, a surprise that, uh, that made people unhappy. There, there are serious problems with this because some courts have struck down as unconscionable arbitration terms <coughs> in which the seller agrees to pay the whole cost of the arbitration on the ground that that means the seller will doubtless be in control of the arbitration, the arbitration will be one-sided, and therefore these courts have said the only kind of arbitration is one where the parties agree to share the cost. Why? And then one, the Ninth Circuit held unconscionable under California law uh, a clause that said winner pays, sorry, loser pays, loser pays, the British rule. And I sort of held that unconscionable on the ground that everybody knows that people make a lot of spurious claims in arbitration, so a loser pay system would cause them to have to pay for their folly. So I'm, I'm not sure that any set of terms for paying costs in arbitration is outside the norm of the expected, but I am sure that every set of terms for paying costs in arbitration has at one time or another been held improper. The the, 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 um, the the puzzle, though, for me is why, if you believe this, you didn't just say enforce. It, right? If you believe that it would destroy a company's reputation to have um, a surprising term or a, a, you know, a very negative term, mm -hmm. you could just say enforce. But you didn't do that in either of the cases. Um, instead, you used this theory, this much more complicated theory, by the way. You could have had a simple theory, which is mm -hmm. just you know, enforce. It's a much simpler rule. So, so why, why, why adopt the more complicated theory, which is more friendly to these? I'm to not these sure persons? it's a more complicated theory. Uh, it is a more saying we will take our products back and pay and so on is a more complicated practice, for sure. But I thought that was a practice that had actually been adopted by these firms. And I was about to say one has to contrast it with the practice about warranties. I think warranty terms often come as a surprise to many people, and nobody says, if you don't like our warranty terms, we will, right? If you open up the, the refrigerator box and you discover that the 500-pound thing that has just been maneuvered into your house by professional delivery people who just left includes only a 90-day warranty rather than a five-year warranty, uh, and requires you to take the refrigerator back to the store for service if anything goes wrong. Uh, and we're not going to take the refrigerator back. Pe people apparently are willing to accept that kind of variance in terms as within the expected. Right. So, but, but again, that's, that suggests that you should have gone all the way and just said, we'll defer to whatever, whatever it is you want. And if you say, if you, say um, you can't return it, that's fine, we'll enforce that. It doesn't matter what the term is in, 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 the, in the contract. 
doesn't matter how extreme it is. See, that's what I would have thought you would have said, but you don't say it in either of these and cases. You, and you can imagine that that would be maybe, which is why I said the, the vote. It might be you know, tougher to get a vote from a colleague. It might be more hostily received by other judges because they say this is too extreme or what you did was right. sort of Solomonic. I think that's and it could be a signal yeah. to, to people in the market you know, shyster corporation, you can do this, whereas yours leaves open the possibility that the shyster corporation with the ten thousand dollars might get caught. It's talk. really no. My my response is that there's no difficulty getting getting votes. The only internal bargaining about votes was in Pro CD, and it had to do with the role of contracts in copyrights. Uh, that was very carefully discussed among the judges, but the contract language in Pro CD. Straightforward contract language in Hill. Straightforward. No, my it's it's first part of the common law tradition that you that sufficient under the day is the evil thereof, uh, and it's also part of this it's part of my strategy to say, look, the, the people are making sensible decisions. It is not as if anybody <coughs> is threatening to eat the consumer's children. That's not a good way of doing business. We don't observe these businesses trying to do that. Uh, make, making that point about contractual institutions is, I think, an important thing for good. Yeah, I, I do think, uh, I'll stop here, though, that you, if you extend that logic uh, far enough, you don't need any kind of legal enforcement at all. Because if it, if it came, became widely known that Gateway's computers don't work or they don't deliver the computer after you've sent the money, you, know, you could say the same thing. Uh, they'll go out of business. So the simplest rule would just be, we're not going to do it. Well, the, 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 they don't deliver the computers after you've sent the money. Most people... That would destroy the company? Well, in, in, in most the people would say, all of this is self-enforcing through reputation. Right. The amount of litigation you have about these computers is, is right. trivial anyway, except for the last period problem. If Gateway says, we're going to go out of business, so for our last six months, we're just going to take the money and run. You actually do need legal enforcement for the last period problem because at that point you don't they don't care about their reputation. So I'll have a question. Uh, I have a question, I think, for uh, Randy. You know, I'm interested in Frank's reaction too. I think I know Frank's reaction, so one hear yours first. So it's, I'm puzzled a little bit. I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but I'm puzzled about the hostility to people who don't like price discrimination. I'm trying to understand. If it has something to do with copyright or it's everywhere. So I understand there are some areas where the seller is lucky in a way and can prevent arbitrage. You know, the airline sells you a ticket at one price, sells me a ticket at another price, and they're able to use security and photo IDs yeah, or something. Right. I mean, maybe you like that, maybe you don't. Even a law school could give a lower price, promise fellowship to people who do public interest work, charge a higher price to other people. We don't let them sell their seat in the class. Right to anybody and all that. But but your case isn't one like that. So would you have said the same thing, say, about De Beers selling diamonds or something? That if they had sold a diamond package with, we're charging a commercial price for this diamond, that means you can resell it. But if you're buying the individual price for the diamond, it's a much cheaper price. Uh, but then you're promising never to resell it, never to reset it, only to keep it in your family. You would also be hostile to that person trying to come up with a way to arbitrage around it? Yeah, so, so I mean, I think the real case of that, of course, is are the Monsanto seed cases, yeah. right? I mean, do you know those cases? Yeah, but so, I'm trying to show one where there's no intellectual property at stake. In order to try to understand, is it something about intellectual property that gets you going here, or it's just generally that you love price discrimination and think that the consumer surplus argument there overcomes well, I don't. I, yeah, I don't have an answer, I guess. I mean, so in the paper, I talk through some of the history of the evolution of price discrimination in the copyright statute, right? And I've talked about some of that in other work. So, I mean, the evolution of that is, is that you're constantly facing the question of, if you don't allow price discrimination, then which market will they choose to serve, right? And so the um, first emergence of, of, co of price discrimination in the copyright statute is, is where the public performance right shows up. And so the public performance right allows an author to say, well, I'll sell written plays to this group and they can read them, but if you want to put it on Broadway, right, here's a different price. And, and you know, you can work through the, obviously, alternatives there, but the advantage of the separation regime is, is that they don't say, okay, well, given the existence of Broadway, we're just going to charge the high price and people in Akron, Ohio, where I grew up, will never be able to read these plays. But I, me personally, 
I don't know, but I've got a strong. But you say the same thing about the documents then. Well, again, I, I, my instinct is to say yes, absolutely. And as I say, I know I've said that in print with regard to the seed case, and you don't like, you don't want to do the IP. Right. It doesn't sound right. Doesn't the center right apply to diamonds or car? I understand they, you know, they might have an incentive not to do that in some markets, but yeah, I guess I didn't think so. Of Frank, where are you on that? If I sell you a diamond and I say you can't arbitrage it, that's great for you. Well, that of course violates the ancient rule against restraints on alienation. Yeah, well, that's where I'm going. So. Yeah, put, put put that to to one side. You know, I, I've. Putting arguments along the lines of the rule against perpetuities can whether oh, A and B do affect yeah. generations from now about what happens to this diamond. You know, my reaction is we don't know economically whether price discrimination is good or bad. And this is one of Dennis Carlton's main themes in his antitrust work. We know price discrimination can increase the return <coughs> to a particular activity. Uh, we know that it can, in the perfect price discrimination, will enable you to, to sell down a marginal cost and also enable you to extract the entire consumer surplus. We also know that there's no such thing as perfect price discrimination in a world where you've got imperfect price discrimination with the function looking like a sawtooth. You really don't know what's good or what's bad. And if I don't know what's good and what's bad, and there's no rule against price discrimination, I'm inclined to leave that to people to to bargain out, uh, subject to arbitrage, of course. What I don't understand is why the University of Chicago doesn't engage in arbitrage. Uh, and maybe, maybe deans should demand a larger role in this. Let me, let me give you an example of price discrimination in copyright. Uh, if you go to one of the, nor if you subscribe to one of the North Holland journals, uh, you discover that North Holland charges, what, $2,000 a year to the University of Chicago library to subscribe to their journal. But they'll sell it to you, they'll sell a subscription to you for $80 or $100. And I've never, and so these are sold, they aren't licensed, it's not subject to a pro CD type license. They don't contract with you not to resell it to somebody else. So why doesn't the University of Chicago have the head librarian buy personal subscriptions to the North Holland journals and then resell them to the library for cost plus a 10% fee, uh, which would make the librarian very happy? Uh, I keep asking that question and I keep getting answers from employees of the University of Chicago along the lines of, oh, that wouldn't be ethical. <laughs> I'm going, excuse me. No, that's right. <laughs> Well, no, my response is not it wouldn't be ethical response. Well, cool. <laughs> you said, you God, said Zeidenberg God, was evil monster. You said he was evil incarnate. Yeah. And he was trying to do the same thing. But Zeidenberg, well, no, 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 Zeidenberg no. had promised not to arbitrage. His, his, well, let's have a library see when it says individual subscription. They think that's a promise. That's what they say. <laughs> yeah, so when I said evil incarnate, yeah, I, I guess two things on that. So one is my assumption that in a world in which we don't allow the contract to be enforceable that I expect um, pro CD to sell only in the commercial market in which case the consumer market vanishes right so so my world is one where I do I want a world with only the con commercial market or I do want one with the commercial mm -hmm. and the consumer and to make that work I need to make sure I can sustain the arbitrage mm -hmm. and I need a contract to I do thought that. the individual could buy from the commercial intermediary I don't think so I mean, that's what makes it commercial well not not in resell and compete Right? Well, he could use it non-commercially. Right? That's... There, there were three kinds of things you could do with the database. You could use it yourself to find somebody's zip code. You could... Consumer market. Sell, sell the data to a third party. Or you could use it in your business. And effectively, ProCD was trying to sell to price in three ways. If you were a consumer who wanted to look up zip codes, you got the cheap version. If you were a business who wanted to use it in your business, uh, you paid the, for the pro price. And if you wanted to sell the data for third parties, you couldn't buy the database at any price. ProCD wanted to exactly. sell that itself. Right. And I, I don't see how you sustain that without sustaining the contract. So mine was not an ethical position. 
please don't accuse me. But by the way, <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think it's ethics in the end about why we don't have Judith Wright buying all these personal subscriptions and transferring them. It's that when anybody got got that idea, North Holland and the other academic journal publishers changed their model so that they now engage in extremely sophisticated price discrimination. They don't have, they don't charge two thousand dollars for the journal anymore. Well, they will if that's all you want. But they'll sell you a package of all of their journals available online, and the amount you pay depends on is negotiated individually with each university. So the University of Chicago pays a different price from Harvard, which pays a different price from Yale for their package. Right. You don't understand that as an ethical response, do you? No, I, okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I don't understand the dynamics. We'll no, we'll talk about that separately. Uh, so I, I have also a question to, to Frank about the Procity case. I'm actually a big fan of that case, uh, so much so that I, couldn't, I wanted to write about it, but I couldn't find anything bad to say. <laughs> um, and I agree that mo many of the critiques are based on the fact that people don't like the kind this particular policy, and they are largely silenced by that by that JLS by finding the JLS article by Florencia Maruta Wergler, a, a terrific article that showed that there is no, no difference. But there is another line of critique that uh, 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 that has been uh, repeated by commentators, and if there is a, some a line of disagreement in state supreme courts, it is the following, and that has to do with the way you read the statute, uh, the unif Article Two of the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, uh, you applied uh, the uh, the agreement you analyzed along this idea that there is an offer and it is accepted by virtue of the product not being returned. Uh, um, sections two six oh six of the code and and the like, which is, you offered as an analogy, but applied principles of contract law and read the statute. There is an additional term, <coughs> and, 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 and Zeidenberg's lawyers, I think, tried to argue along the lines of section two two seven of the code. And, and uh, you rejected that um, particular claim in a way that I find I still find puzzling. Is that 227, that is the battle of the forms case, and we know that for the battle of the forms, we need two forms. And we only had one here, so it doesn't apply. Um, uh, well, 227, if you were to apply it, and for example, in another gateway case, the Kansas Supreme Court, I think, applied it, found that the terms in the box just cannot be part of the contract if they came in the box they cannot be part of the contract with consumers. It could be part of the contract between merchants, but these additional memoranda attached after the initial uh, uh, communication are only proposals, and they are not part of the contract unless affirmatively accepted by, assented to by the, by the consumer. Uh, and the comments to Section 207 talk about the fact that Section applies whether there is one or two forms. And I think many, many uh, commentators say, OK, well, the decision is wrong altogether because of that, what they consider to be a mistake. I mean, my colleague, ex-colleague J.J. White said, said, you know, it's clearly a mistake in reading section 227. And, and I was always wondering how that came about. I actually have no memory of what people were saying about 2207 at the time of Pro-CD and since the and uh, Randy's and Eric's papers didn't go into that. I didn't go back and think about it. So I, I, I actually don't know. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. But my, <laughs> you know, my, my thinking about the transaction was the, the problem with the, the district court's analysis. No, forget the practicalities of this and whether people really want cashiers to read them 6,000 words on the spot. The, the problem of, of this was that there were, the district court and the plaintiff wanted us to think of the sale as being made by the retailer to you. But this was actually a software licensing transaction. The retailer wasn't licensing the software to you because the retailer hadn't made the software. And what the outside, the thing that was most important in ProCD on the outside of the box said, you are buying this software. You're getting a license to this software. And the license to this software comes from us, the authors, and not this retail store. The retail store can't sell you something that we are putting up for licensing because they don't own it to begin with. So it, the transaction that occurred in the store couldn't possibly have been the right transaction. The only transaction was the one that occurred, the relevant transaction was the one that occurred between the customer and the, the author of the software. Uh, and 
that ha just had to be analyzed separately from what happened at the cash register because they didn't own the intellectual property rights in it. We are out of time. I would invite you all to uh, come. There's wine and cheese. I, uh, I regret now more than ever being thrown out of Judge Easterbrook's class because I could sit and listen to him uh, and these other guys all day. But uh, we don't have any more time. So I want to thank everybody for uh, their comments. And please join us in the reception. Afterwards.